Hello everyone and welcome to Could This Be the Future of Student Loan Payments? Tax-Free Employer Contributions and pay Payroll Deductions brought to you by the American Bar Association, Young Lawyers Division, and GradFin. Today's speaker is Chris Walters, current GradFin CEO and a former tax professional that has worked for the U.S. Treasury Department. Chris, can you get us started? Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the webinar. Welcome to the webinar, and thank you to the American Bar Association's Young Lawyers Division for helping set this up, and we are pleased to be here. My name is Chris Walters, and I am the CEO of GradFin. Today I'm going to be presenting to you about the future of student loan payments. I'm excited to speak to such a large audience of lawyers as well as lawyers in the making. A lot of us have student debt, and it would be great if there were real solutions to help us pay down this student debt a lot faster. We're going to be talking about these ideas today because we have some tax code solutions that I think you're all going to find very appealing. All right, so let's refer back to your notes during law school when you took your classes about taxation. As you know, the tax code is about 4,000 pages long, but only a few of those pages are devoted to student loans. We will get into this soon, specifically talking about the student loan interest deduction, which has an income cap, by the way. As you'll see, this has a limited benefit for student borrowers, especially borrowers making over $80,000 in income who don't get any benefit of it. Today we're going to discuss current tax, particularly as it relates to your student loans. And we want to turn the tax code on its head and really shake it up because we have some ideas to make the tax code much more appealing if you have student loans you keep, because these ideas are going to help you pay down your loans a lot faster. All we need is a little help from Congress, which is always a tough thing to ask. But fortunately, we have some great ideas to get this agenda in front of Congress. If you go to www.gradfin.com backslash ABA, that is where we're going to be directing people to send an email to their member of Congress, also to sign a petition to get a question asked at the next presidential debate this Sunday night. I'll get into that in a little bit. We're also going to make this a huge issue before Congress over the next year, especially as a new president takes office in January. I'd like to keep the presentation as interactive as possible. I know everyone is on mute, but as Tracy said, you can type in questions in the question page. We love any questions, I'll, I'll try to get them up as, as they come in. All right, so let's take a look at today's agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about GradFin and how we are helping borrowers pay back their student loans faster. We are at the forefront of the employer student loan assistance industry, and we're helping employers set up these plans at their offices. Next, we are going to take a look back in time and discuss the enactment into law of the 401k. This is a history lesson. What happened with the 401k market definitely means something for the future of student loan payments. Let's use that as a baseline. Okay, and after that, I think we're going to discuss the current law of student loans. As you know, there's not much in the tax code for student loans, and that's why we're here today, because we want to change that. And next, we're, we're going to talk about the after-tax expense of student loans. It's very sobering. What we're going to show you, the IRS treats student loan payments as taxable income, both, both from the perspective of the employee and your company and your employer. I'll show you some numbers about how much student loan borrowers are giving away to the IRS before they get to make their student loan payments. We're also going to talk about student uh, loan legislative solutions. These are going to help you save years on your payments. We have a bunch of student loan, uh, student loan solutions that, that are up before Congress right now. And so what we're going to do, we're also going to take you, you should go to www.gradfin.com backslash ABA because we have uh, a submission set up so that you can email your member of Congress and also, as I mentioned, a petition for the debate on Sunday night. Gradfin is a student loan benefit company based here in Washington, D.C. We have offices in Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago. Gradfin provides employer-based solutions to help employees reduce their student loan debt. 
GradFin sets up employer-sponsored student loan payment plans. We do this through a payroll deduction, deduction with your employer. GradFin also offers employees access to our student loan refinancing platform to reduce their interest rates and consolidate their loans. And we offer advice to employees on ways to pay off their student debt faster. We would love to discuss these options with your employer. And if you can send me an email, uh, my contact information is at the end of the, the slide deck today, or email your, or there's a contact uh, section on our, our website, www.gradfin.com backslash ABA, and you can enter in your contact information as well as your employer. We can give them a call and set that up. Finally, we'd love to talk to you about how we can help refinance your student loans. We have eight lenders that we work with. You can sign up on our webpage for a 15-minute consultation at your convenience. We will also provide you with a $200 bonus if you refinance with one of our lenders. So I want to briefly discuss GradFin's mission. GradFin is a member of 1776, a leading startup incubator based in Washington, D.C. 1776 helps startups transform industries such as education to help millions of people lead better lives. 1776 is built on the philosophy that highly regulated markets must be hacked in order to break through and build better services for Americans. This is called regulatory hacking. We are in the education and finance space. As you know, it's very highly regulated and the tax laws are really not on our side. So Gradfin, what we're doing is we're leading the effort in Washington to encourage Congress to pass legislation to provide a tax exclusion on the employer and employee for student loan payments. And I'll get into these solutions today. We really believe that if we can hack into this highly regulated industry, we're going to really shake up the way your student loan payments are made. Again, my name is Chris Walters. I'm the CEO of Gradfin. I have over 15 years of public policy experience in Washington. I am a tax and financial services public policy professional, and I have served in many leadership positions on Capitol Hill, at the U.S. Treasury Department, and for many trade associations. I'm using that experience to help push Congress to change these laws to help student loan borrowers. And I'm really excited about doing this today and talking about the future of student loan payments. So let's get into our history lesson. The 401k industry was created back in 1978 when Congress signed the Revenue Act of 1978. The act included a provision in there that became IRS code section 401k. I think you all know what that means. It allows employees to not be taxed on the portion of income they elect to receive as deferred compensation rather than as direct cash payments. It helps them save for retirement. It went into effect on January 1st, 1980. Regulations were issued by November of 1981. Between 1979 and 1982, there were several companies, including Johnson & Johnson, PepsiCo, J.C. Penney, Honeywell, Savannah Foods and Industries, that all developed their 401k plans many of which officially began in operation by January of 1982. By 1990, there were 90, over 97,000 401k plans across America. The number of active participants in 1990, there was over 19 million employees that participated in these plans by 1990. And the total assets were about $385 billion. By 1996, as you can see here, there were, it reached the, the $1 trillion mark. And there were over 230,000 plans, almost double from 1990. And there were over 30 million participants in America. And today, there is over $4.5 trillion in assets in 401ks. This is a huge number. It would not exist today if Congress did not open up the floodgates to 401k plans by providing a tax exclusion for contributions. I think we need to use this as an example of what could lie in the future for student loans. Except, think about it this way. Instead of using the tax code to build assets, to build savings, 
we are using the tax code to reduce liabilities, to reduce Americans' debt loads, to reduce their student loan debt. This is very meaningful stuff. We just need to get Congress to do it. All right, so let's go into the current tax treatment of student loans. And there you have it. Here is the only benefit available for student loan borrowers. It is the student loan interest deduction. So if your modified adjusted gross income is less than $80,000 or $160,000 if you're filing a joint return, there is a special deduction allowed for paying interest on your student loans. The deduction can reduce the, the amount of your income subject to tax by up to $2,500. However, it's very limited, as a lot of folks on this phone know. The interest deduction gets phased out between $65,000 and $80,000, or $130,000 or $160,000 if you file a joint return. And you can't even claim the du deduction if your income is over $80,000. The IRS actually has a worksheet on their website for taxpayers that need to calculate how much you can, can, can deduct. This is useful for people that make $65,000 to $80,000. Again, if you are above $80,000 in income, you cannot take this deduction. I'm pretty sure a lot of the people on the phone call are bummed about that. All right, so let's talk about how the tax code treats current student loan payments from you and your employer. This is current law. So currently, student loan payments are taxable as compensation. Therefore, all payments made by an employer to help their employees pay back student loans are taxed as ordinary income. Employers that offer these plans should withhold taxes from these student loan payments just like they would do when they, make, when they pay their employees' compensation. Employers should also pay payroll taxes on top of the payments because any form of compensation is considered taxable for payroll purposes as well. What that means is that in addition to the payment that your employer makes, your employer must add 6.2% on top of that for Social Security and 1.45% for Medicare payroll taxes. So if you look at the bottom here, I'll show you the most simple example. If your employer makes a $100 payment to you each month, they need to add $7.65 on top of that, and that's the payroll taxes. And I'm going to go into the numbers a little bit more here so you can get a further understanding. Now, I just went through that $100 example. Your employer that makes a payment to your student loan should expect to pay an additional $7.65 for payroll. That is $107.65 payment per month. Now, let's go into this. Let's just go into it what it means for the employee. If the employee gets a payment from their employer to their student loan, the employer must withhold taxes from the employee as well. So this dilutes the benefit even further. This is unfair, isn't it? Yes. So basically, the employee withholds $20 if they are in the 20% tax bracket for withholding. So a $100 contribution is all of a sudden worth $80 to your student loan. And if you make more than $80,000, you will not be able to deduct any of the interest payments. At the end of the day, the IRS is getting a huge benefit out of this. They are getting $27.65, which is split up between that $20 that you're withholding and the $7.65 that's going to the payroll uh, to pay payroll taxes. That's not a bad deal for the IRS. It's actually going to make it much harder for you as an employee to pay, to pay back your student loans faster. We are dealing with after-tax income that goes to your student loan servicer. We really need to change that. That is what we're going to get, that's what we're getting at here today. So what's the first idea that we have? Aha! Let's go to section 127 of the tax code. 
we are looking here because this is the biggest idea we have to make this a much more efficient payment system in the future. We want tax efficiency. So what is section 127, you ask? Section 127 of the Internal Revenue Code provides a $5,250 per year tax exclusion to each employee that receives tuition assistance from their employer. That's tuition assistance. For example, if an employer offers an annual benefit to its employees to help them pay for graduate school, the employee can exclude the first $5,250 of this benefit from their taxes. That means no payroll taxes on $5,250 of these payments from your employer. That means no withholding of for the employee. This is great stuff, especially for employees that can get non-taxed tuition assistance from their employer. However, Section 127 does not apply to student loan payments. But there are major legislative proposals that I'm going to talk about that would expand Section 127 to include them. What we want to do is, is amend this part of the tax code, Section 127. And we want to add student loan payments to the definition. We are serious about this, and we think this is really going to change the loan payment system in the future. So here are the proposed legislative solutions in Congress right now. GradFin is very supportive of legislation that would amend Section 127. There are several bills that have been introduced in the House and in the Senate to make this change, which effectively would allow, as I said, $5,250 tax exclusion per year per employee. By the way, what we want you to do is to go to our website, www.gradfin.com backslash ABA, and fill out our form so that you can email your member of Congress to support these bills. So these bills have a lot in common. They all define the benefit as, quote, the payment by an employer whether paid to the employee or to a lender of principal or interest on any qualified education loan. They also define qualified education loan and bring that back to the, the part of the tax code that deals with the student loan interest uh, deduction, which is part of section 221 of the tax code. So let's roll through these bills right now. The first bill, H.R. 3861, it's called the Employer Participation in Student Loan Assistance Act. It was sponsored by Rodney Davis, a Republican from Illinois, and Gwen Graham, a Democrat from Florida. However, currently it has 30 co-sponsors, and it's the leading bill in Congress based on the number of co-sponsors. Rodney Davis is a fantastic member of Congress from the great state of Illinois, and he's doing a great job of making sure this is a bipartisan issue. It has 15 Democrats and 15 Republicans that are co-sponsors on the bill. We need to keep this as bipartisan as possible in order for it to have the best shot at passing. So the next bill, S-2457, this is a Senate bill. It's called the Employer Participation in Repayment Act of 2016, and it's sponsored by Senator Mark Warner, a Democrat from Virginia, as well as Senator John Thune, a Republican from South Dakota. The importance of this is Senator Warner and Senator Thune are both very high-profile senators, and they're both members of the Senate Finance Committee. This committee has jurisdiction over tax issues. This is the leading bill in the Senate right now, with over five co-sponsors. The next bill, H.R. 5191, to help for Parents and Students Act of 2016, introduced by Congressman Robert Dold. He's a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, and he's a Republican from Illinois. The House Ways and Means Committee also has jurisdiction over tax issues, so that's why this bill is very important. But this bill actually goes a little bit further than the other ones. It provides a tax credit for the employer. I think this is a great idea. It would provide a tax credit to the employer based on the annual amount contributed to employees' student loans. It caps this amount at 50% of the payments made by the employer. So basic, basically, 
if the employer provides a student loan assistance plan to its employees, and this is you know a seventy thousand dollar plan per year, they would get a fifty percent tax credit. The company would get a tax credit. So that works out to about a thirty-five thousand dollar tax credit. It's really good stuff because it would encourage the empl employer to get into the game and offer these plans and help their employees. Okay, so our last bill, HR 5415, the Helping Employers Lessen Payments for Students Act of 2016. This bill was introduced by Congressman, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. She's a Republican from New York. And by the way, she's the youngest member of Congress and the so-called leader of millennials in Congress. And actually, this bill is interesting because it increases the benefit to $10,000 per year for each employee. So it goes almost double the other bills. So let me briefly touch on the tax and employer implications. If there's any employers on the phone right now thinking about how this, after it gets passed in the law, how, uh, what are the implications of, of creating the plan? So if the tax law is passed, is, is passed in the law, it allows for a tax exclusion for employer student loan payments. And the IRS is probably going to need to provide guidance on how this works. And this is going to allow employers to learn um, you know, what, what types of plans they can offer. I expect this guidance will cover key issues, such as non-discrimination rules and certain limitations of the tax exclusion, among other things. I also expect the non-discrimination rules to be very similar to the tuition assistance benefit in Section 127. For example, owners of a company cannot benefit from more than 5%, and this is the non-discrimination rules from Section 127, they can't benefit from more than 5% of the total company payments, and employers would need to follow rules for highly compensated employees. This shouldn't be a big deal to many of you, but I thought I would mention it because non-discrimination rules are a very important part of the, uh, ERISA. We also expect the IRS to draft rules prevent, to prevent double dipping of the tax exclusion. So if we're amending Section 127, what they might want to prevent is if an employee wants to double dip and get the benefit of the tuition assistance as well as the student loan benefit. And so what I expect, and you know, further conversations could happen in Congress, but employees wouldn't be able to get, you know, uh, ten and a half thousand dollars of both benefits. They would just get the fifty two fifty and have have to share between the tuition and the student loan assistance. So there's probably going to be other employer and tax implications that may be furnished by the IRS, and we're going to keep an eye on, that, on them, um, especially when, when it gets passed into law. So you're probably asking, what is the likelihood this gets done this year? You're also wondering, what is the status of the legislation as of right now? The House Ways and Means Committee which, has, which I mentioned has jurisdiction over tax policy issues, actually has not held a hearing on this bill or have they have not had a, any markups on the, this bill. And it's important to note that the House and Senate have not acted on any major pieces of tax legislation dealing with student loans during the entire 114th Congress. However, there's limited time in the legislative calendar this year reducing the changes, chances of passage this year even more. So what happens after the election, November 8th, there's usually a, a lame duck session when members of Congress come back to Washington, D.C., and they have to pass end of year, anything end of the year that is really important that they haven't gotten done yet. For example, the budget. They have to pay for federal government programs uh, for the fiscal year of 2017 and before they left last week, they actually extended um, a, the, the federal spending until December 9th. So we know they're going to come back this year again. What we don't think they're going to do is act on smaller things like this um, or other types of issues. So what that means is that they're going to have to reintroduce these bills next year because next year is a brand new Congress, a new president comes in, 
and uh, that's when the new budget process starts. So what we can do right now is we can encourage people up in Congress to support these bills. I like the 30 co-sponsor number of the Rodney Davis bill, but we need a lot more. So Gradfin has a page set up, www.gradfin.com backslash ABA, and if you scroll down, you can, you can enter your information and we'll send the, the email up to your member of Congress. Let me quickly touch on the presidential election because that is going to have ramifications on this as well. And I know what you're thinking. These candidates have not spent much time at all talking about actual policy issues. But if you look closely at Hillary's plan, which can be found on her website, she announced a plan, and I quote, to create a payroll deduction portal for employers and employees to simplify the repayment process and explore more options to encourage employers to help pay down debt. I think that's exciting. However, on the other hand, Republican candidate Donald Trump has not provided any details about what he would do to help borrowers with student debt, at least the last time I checked on, on his website. What we also have is a big debate coming up on Sunday night. And we have a petition on our website, which we're going to be sending to the debate moderators later this week. We would love if you can sign it so we can bump up these numbers. So you go to www.gradfin.com backslash ABA and you'll find the petition there. We're going to probably take it down in, in the next couple days because uh, the debate's on Sunday night, so make sure you get there. So the next steps, as I briefly mentioned, if legislation is not passed this year, that's fine. We're hopeful in the, the new Congress next year and the new administration can hit the ground running. We're going to be out there asking these members of Congress if they're elected again to reintroduce their bills and we're going to push the new administration to include this tax exclusion in their annual budget for 2017. We think that the key is for any new president to work with Congress on student loan legislation, it needs to be bipartisan. That's why we really like the Rodney Davis bill. It has 15 Republicans, 15 Democrats. We've got to make sure we keep this as bipartisan as possible. We definitely need your help to do that. So we actually have another solution that's out there. It's in the beginning stages, and I'm going to go through it a little bit right now. It goes back to that 401k area of the tax code. As you know, the federal tax code contains a number of provisions designed to encourage individuals to save for retirement. Traditional employer-sponsored uh, defined benefit plans. And these are all in uh, this, this part of the tax code. So each taxpayer can defer up to up to $18,000 in 2015 and 2016, plus an additional $6,000 if you're over 50 years of age. This $18,000 exclusion cap for employees is obviously helpful to help you um, save for retirement, but much, and I believe, much of the annual tax benefit is out of reach for many of Americans especially young Americans that do not have room in their budget to, to utilize the full $18,000 contribution. Now look at this report from Vanguard. It's called Vanguard, How America Saves. It shows that the average 25 to 34 year old has $23,000 in their 401k balance. And the average 35 to 44 year old has about $62,000 in their 401k. I think we know from these stats that most younger Americans struggle to come even close to utilize the $18,000 cap, especially younger Americans with heavy student debt loads. It's hard to set aside $18,000 per year in retirement when your salary is, especially if your salary is averaging $40,000 and you have about $35,000 in student loans outstanding. The 18,000 employee contribution cap for retirements is definitely out of reach. 
what we believe is that the sooner younger Americans can pay down their student loans, the sooner they will be able to allocate a larger portion of their salary to their retirement plans. So here's our idea. Congress should consider allowing younger Americans struggling to utilize that full $18,000 cap. They should allow an option to set aside pre-tax employee contributions to their student loan payments. Why not allow employees to utilize up to 50% of that $18,000, which, which is effectively $9,000 of that tax exclusion cap and utilize it for t their student loan contributions. I think this really deserves some attention. There's actually not a bill yet in Congress that would do this, but we're going to be taking it to Congress alongside the other solutions that we mentioned earlier. And I have one question that came in um, from the last slide, which could you please confirm that the tax exclusion would apply to federal employees too? Yes, that's, that's confirmed. Federal employees, private employees, um, the way that, that all the bills are written as of right now, they're, uh, you, get, you get the benefit. You would get the benefit if it passed into law. And I think that most, most employees would, would be happy about that. It's all about would their employer come in you might be aware that the federal government, they actually were the ones that created student loan assistance plans. There's about 40 million um, federal workers that have uh, benefited from this uh, since 2002. And this is really where we got the idea from. Although it's being taxed right now, um, which is a problem, but the federal government is, is still spending about uh, $50 million a year to help federal employees with student loan debt. And so if, we're, if we can take that to the private sector. But back to the question, yes, it does apply to uh, federal employees as well. So why don't I walk you through what uh, GradFin is helping uh, employees. Effectively, if your employer um, put out a student loan assistance plan, as well as you, if you took advantage of refinancing, and your, your remaining balance was about $75,000. So let's look at the current loan. If you have a 15-year term, a lot of you that, ha that took out graduate school loans, the, there's around a 6.87% interest rate. Um, if your monthly payment is around $675, but right now if your employer is not contributing, then um, you're basically uh, you're, you're basically paying, sorry, uh, what it works out to. And with GradFin, what we would do is, is refinance your loan as well as hopefully uh, facilitate the payment process from your employer. Most employers are adding $100 uh, of an employer payment per month uh, to their employees. And, and this is after taxes. If, if the tax law passes, this is going to be a $100 payment, not, not an $80 payment. This could help you save about $35,000 in savings if you get the employer contribution and the refinancing. I think that's what we're generally getting at with GradFin. That's what we want the future of student loan payments to look like. Huge amounts of savings. Savings in which $35,000, that's exceptionally huge number of uh, dollars that you can start contributing to saving for a home, saving for your kids' uh, education, or for, even for your retirement, or putting it to other uses. So what we're trying to do really is, is really just change that structure. So this is what it looks like on our website right now. Uh, we have www.grafton.com backslash ABA, and this is our petition. And we've had, I think, 95 supporters before I actually got on the phone. Hopefully, everybody that's on the, the call today can go on and sign the petition. We're going to send this up in a couple days to the moderators to make sure that they get uh, this uh, question asked on student loans for the debate on Sunday night. And 
if you're not familiar with it, with, with the debate, this is actually public uh, participation with this debate. So the moderators don't con control the questions as much during this. So it's a lot of public input. And so we're excited about this opportunity. What we also have at www.grabfin.com backslash ABA, if you go on here, you can schedule a 15-minute consultation with one of our GrabFin representatives. And it's really quick. You just punch in a, a time that works in your schedule. 15 minutes is all it takes. We'll give you a call. We'll go through your current loan structure and your uh, what your interest rates are, how much you owe, and, and talk about one of the eight lenders uh, that, that might give you the best rate. Uh, that, that we deal with. We'll also throw in the, this $200 Moby Deck gift card uh, for ABA members and this will go uh, to uh, straight to your principal balance if you choose one of our, our lenders. Um, let me actually go to a couple of the questions that came in and I'll stick it on the contact section. So if, if you want to reach out to me, my phone number and my email address are right there. All right, so we have a question. If you're under a federal public service forgiveness plan and you refinance, won't that remove the benefits offered by the federal government? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the federal government has um, income-based repayment plans. And what we recommend, especially for folks that are, are having trouble paying back their student loans at the at the current time based on uh, what their current income is is to keep those benefits as long as possible however if you're in a situation where you're making a lot of income and you have high interest li rate loans and you want to go to a private lender now's the time to do that especially with uh, rates being as low low as they are and if you can afford the payment uh, we have 5 10 15 20 year so you can stretch out um, the the terms in order to make it it fit for your for cash flow reasons. Um, but but that's a great question. We always recommend making sure that uh, the, the the folks that need the income based repayment plan still take take advantage of that because that's that's something that's that's really been a powerful thing. So another question that came in. Would these tax exemptions apply to private loans or just federal loans? The tax exemptions that I talked about, um, right now the way that the current legislation is written, it applies to both federal loans and private loans. And that's a good thing. It's, uh, we're going to make sure it, it stays that way. Uh, as you know, a lot of folks uh, have federal and private loans, and um, there's about 75% uh, of the loans that are out there of the 1.3 trillion are in federal loans but there, there's a whole big chunk that are also in private loans and we need to make sure that, that, that the, any tax changes applies to both of them and the way it's currently written uh, it would apply to both. So right, the, the next question, are there taxes associated with the loan forgiveness program? And yes, there are. So basically, if you get the benefit, if, so depending on what plan you are, you're in, there's a, there's a private sector plan and a, and a public sector plan uh, where you can pay you know, up to a certain percentage of your income per month. For, for about 10 years if you work in the, in the public sector job. And then it's, forget, it's forgiven after 10 years. Under current law, you're taxed under that. So you would have to pay taxes on any of the, the forgiven debt that, that, the, that is wiped away after 10 years. Private sector, same thing. If, if, you're, if you're signed up for the 20-year plan, after 20 years, you, you have to pay taxes on, on any debt that's forgiven. The key thing to keep in mind is these, these plans didn't even go into effect until 2007, and we're still one year away from some of the first participants. So I think we'll see next year when some of the first participants are getting their, their loans forgiven, how that's going to work out. 
Um, I'd also want you to keep in uh, in the back of your head that you know Congress can change anything at any point. Nothing is permanent anymore, especially when you're dealing with the tax code. So uh, you know uh, uh, something that that that's uh, in the tax code right that's worth a worthwhile incentive for a lot of taxpayers could go away uh, if it's repealed or if if the effective date uh, goes away. So that that's something to consider uh, with with the student loan debt forgiveness plan. I'm not saying it's it's going to go away in in 10 years or 15 years, but you know just looking at a lot of the other uh, fiscal issues going on with uh, baby boomers retiring, uh, you know, Social Security, you know, running low. There might be uh, future Congresses that say, hey, hold on, wait a minute, we don't want to do this debt forgiveness thing anymore because we want to save money to, to pay for Social Security or Medicare. Um, that could happen. I'm not saying it will, but um, it's, it's always something that, that you should look out for. So here's a question. Um, under the 10-year public student loan repayment uh, program, the forgiven debt is not taxed. Only the standard 25-year debt forgiveness is taxed. So thank you for that, uh, for that question. That's actually a clarification of what I said. And I don't see any, any other questions here. Again, what you can do is you can reach out to me. Um, you can also go on to our website, www.grafin.com backslash ABA, and uh, you can submit uh, your, your information. We can get in touch with you that way. Uh, but thank you, Tracy, and thanks for everybody that joined our, our webinar today with the ABA Young Lawyers Division. We really appreciate it.